Welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, we are delighted to be with you today to officially launch our latest online course, which is called Women Leading Change, Shaping Our Future. And we want to have a very informal conversation that will be rich in personal insights. And I'm delighted to be joined today by some of our contributors to the course. So my name is Zoe Arden, I'm a fellow at CISL and I'm the co-convener of this, this new course and delighted to welcome some of our contributors as we have over 30 contributors who um, shared video interviews with us as part of the course um, from all over the world and uh, we're very very proud of, of the the diversity and very, very um, different lived experience of our many contributors, um, some of whom are here. So I'd like to introduce them in the order in which they're going to share some initial thoughts, um, but this conversation will be very much interactive. So please put questions, comments, challenges, observations in the chat, and um, we will make sure that we, we answer as, as many of those as possible. Uh, so firstly, I'd love to welcome Dr. Perna Sen, um, also um, previously my neighbour, it is definitely a small world. <laughs> uh, Perna brings lots of incredible experience. Um, she was Deputy Director of the Institute of Public Affairs at the London School of Economics, where she did some, some specific work on women's leadership herself, actually, some really interesting research. Um, more recently, she was based in New York, where she was Director of Policy at UN Women. Um, and currently, she is uh, back in London and a visiting professor at London Metropolitan University. So welcome, Perna. I'm also delighted to have with us um, Shagha, Shagha Gafuri. Um, Shagha, Shagha is our youngest participant, still only 23. It's a very young, long year, Shagha. Um, and um, Shagfa brings um, some incredibly rich experience. So from the age of 15, she was a social researcher in Afghanistan, uh, which is her home country. Um, she now looks um, at um, policy, uh, where she works at the Centre for European Policy Studies. So, so welcome, Shagfa. I'm also delighted to have uh, Meza Jalbo with us. Um, Mesa is a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institute. Also, she was the uh, former founding scene, scene CEO of Queen Rainier Foundation. Um, and you'll hear Mesa's um, pas passions are very much around the role of the SDGs, social entrepreneurs, and how do we ensure that um, education reaches um, those who are underserved. Um, we also have with us um, Gail Klimtworth, um, I'm delighted to have you with us, Gail. Um, Gail has a, a long career in working in multinationals, including chair of Unilever South Africa. Uh, she went on to be um, chief sustainability officer at uh, Unilever and um, now is chair and board member of a variety of boards and has, partic has a particular passion and interest for work that she's doing in Africa. So welcome, Gail. And last but not least, delighted to have Gillian Secret hit with us. Gillian is the director of our leadership programs at CISL, uh, which she joined um, a couple of years ago. And prior to that, uh, was the CEO of the Muller Institute in Cambridge. So welcome all of you. Delighted to have you with, with, with us. Um, and as I said in one of my posts, I feel like I'm very much walking on the shoulders of giants. So um, thank you for being here. Um, so just a, a little bit of an overview of how we're going to kick off this initial conversation, which very much reflects uh, the lenses through which we look at the course. Um, and the course is um, looking at, um, so both at a macro lens, um, which is where we're going to start our conversation. So what are some of the systemic levers for change? What are the global dimensions? Um, I want to kick off by asking you, Perna, to just provide some initial thoughts on, on, on what you see as the sort of the real barriers for change when it comes to these global sort of systemic levers and, and where you see the opportunities. 
Uh, so um, give us your thoughts or rework that question into whatever is, is burning for you at the moment. <laughs> Thank you for the kind introduction. Hi to everybody. Um, I think this uh, interest around how women lead changes is, is really very important because I think we're all agreed on the issue around representation and the dearth of women in influential positions where real change can be made. And for me, I think some of the big questions that really frame important discussions are around what is leadership about and what change you want to lead. Um, and so I think there's, there's change around representation, which is literally led by issues around numbers. Like, can we put women where women weren't before? And that in itself is a change. But more than that, if you're looking at what, um, what change you want to bring through that, then I think there are questions to be asked about whether you want to change uh, outcomes, whether you want to change processes, whether you want to change structures. And if we're talking about inequality, I think you have to go to that third level. And that's the hardest level, because that's where the most resistance is. And I've always said, and I still believe this to be fundamentally uh, a challenge for all of us working in this field, is the very idea of women in decision-making roles is in itself structurally challenging and extremely dangerous for those who want status quo and who like the way things are now, which is built around systems and structures of inequality. So while we have some incredible, useful tools at our fingertips that we need to know what they are, we need to think about how to use them. So I know there are people here interested in the SDGs, which have very ambitious goals and a very positive vision about the type of world we want to see. And it's only got eight years left to run for full delivery. Let's just remember that. Um, so issues there around gender inequality are very clear, issues around violence are very clear, sustainability, health, working environment, education, those goals are very grand. But what is needed is to actually address the systems and the structures that have been very sustainable, actually, interestingly to use the word that we have sustained for a very long time and over very many generations and over very many different geographical contexts, their persistence and their rigidity is something that's quite remarkable. So I think if we're looking at women's leadership for change, we have to think about how we can anticipate the resistance of those structures and institutions and what it is we do to enable them to change. And that's both in our efforts, what we do, but I actually think the focus needs to shift on where the resistance lies, where the power has to be shifted from and how that is done. And, and I think some of that is about using those international tools that are available, knowing who your networks are, uh, being clear what your ambitions and your agendas and your tools are, and checking back, being always grounded in that constituency that you know is there for you and supporting you through those changes that you want to bring, uh, being grounded in those communities that give us sustenance and, sustenance and nourishment and encouragement to move forward. So I don't know if that's too high level, but I hope that's okay just to kick off. Yeah, that's absolutely wonderful um, to kick us off, Perna. Thank you so much. And an absolutely brilliant segue to our second speaker, Shagafa, talking about being grounded in communities, um, as well as your role, Shagafa, looking at sort of policy at an EU level. I know that you're really keen to sort of touch on today sort of the personal insights that you have uh, in terms of what's going on in Af Afghanistan right now. You know, it was incredible for us while we were creating this course to actually see things shift so dramatically and so quickly in um, Afghanistan last summer. And I, I just, with your permission, um, I just wanted to reflect on one of your posts. Um, you talk about being grounded in community and, and you recently posted that, um, you know, sort of how, how you are feeling um, in terms of what, you know, what you've had to witness going on. You talked about, you know, I have to be strong for those who rely on me. I'm weeping, but I'm strong enough not to be tired of sending emails, making phone calls and looking for solutions to save lives. I knocked on every single door to save my father who has assisted international NGOs in Afghanistan for over 20 years. And my courageous mother who fought for democracy and human rights for years, who taught me how to be brave, how to stand for human rights and gender equality, who taught me and thousands of others how to fly. Although it's genuinely sad, where we are, I can't give up. Um, so, you know, wanted to get your your personal insights, and I know that we've seen some some good news there as well. So that we can also bring that in. So, so Shagfa, love love your thoughts. 
Thank you very much for this interesting question and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, I will start from uh, from the last sentence that you ended. Uh, it is that um, when you understand the context that you live in and you, you understand from the very beginning that you don't have any chance to give up. And if you give up, this is something that not affects your life, but the lives of millions of people that rely on you. Um, the most important thing, I think, is to understand the context that we, we would like to work on it and understand what kind of society we are working in. Uh, from my background and from Afghanistan, we started from scratch. I am the product of the, the 20 years of efforts of international communities, the women empowerment, capacity building, and all those sorts of efforts, not from only one country, but an international context in Afghanistan. And where we started was from, from a very low level, but we, um, we already knew that we have a very, very long way ahead of us to go. And for me, as a, as a very little kid, I was always full of this passion and idea for change uh, also like that was the age that i i wanted to play i wanted to 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 have uh, some pleasure spend some time around but uh, this was always in my mind that we have to go for a change because this is a historical moment for all of us and if we act this is something that will remain in the history and this is a very timely moment to talk about this because what happens in Afghanistan is now reflecting that also all the efforts of the last 20 years of Afghan women and the international community in Afghanistan has been vanished in a matter of a couple of hours. We still see that great passion, we still see that, that courage and we still see that resistance that say to all of us that even though we see that all of our efforts of the last 20 years has been vanished, but we are still raising our voices. And they know they know that they are standing uh, against a super uh let's say powerful and uh, and well organized and structured terrorist group so um what what here is reflected is that um it's uh, when you understand the context that you're working on it can clear to all of us on um how long of a vision that uh, we need to have and how how much um passion we need to have for this for the change that we are opting for and uh one one great example that i want to bring is that um when the collapse happened in afghanistan no one was believing that uh afghan women could stand against this very dangerous criminal terrorist group that is governing the the, the country now but we saw those women and we, i talked with many of them and they said when i go out of the house i kiss my child and i say goodbye to him because I don't know whether I will be back or not but I am going out not only for myself but we go to change the history and this needs a great passion and we reflected on this and based on this we see that um, yesterday in the, in the European Parliament uh, it was announced during the Afghan Women Day that uh, EU is going to release a new resolution uh, that uh, clear um, clearly it states that they will not recognize Taliban, but there would be some engagement to find uh, find more grounds uh, in order to, to see how, how would the further developments be. So this is a great example to say that although there might be very less light that you see around, but if there is only one light that you see at the end of the tunnel, it's very important to be super passionate about it and pull all, put all the efforts possible to make a change. And every single single change that we make would be historical and is not only affecting one person. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shagfa. Um, so, Mays, I wanted to move on to you um, and uh, Perna, Perna alluded to the SDGs at the beginning and, and I know that um, through your work, you, know, you, you are a special advisor on the SDGs um, as part of your work as a visiting scholar. Um, to Arizona State University and MIT and I know that this is also a very personal agenda for you and I reflect on the conversation that we had in in your interview where you talked about how absolutely essential it is for women and girls um, to get education to get educate to get opportunities and to have a voice um, at the table um, and, and specifically about the sort of role of social entrepreneurship. So Maisa, would love your, your thoughts on this. 
Right. Well, um, first of all, I just wanted to say that uh, what Shagaf was talking about is so inspiring, and I'm so happy to have her as part of this discussion. Um, I think that um, what she's talking about is something that women around the world in many developing countries that have been through wars and traumas and, you know, are experiencing, um, you know, many, many, many different challenges. It's, it's so relatable, but she's talking about something that's real and live and going on now and that requires so much solidarity and so much courage uh, among all of us and especially women. Uh, around the world uh, to match the courage of women in, in Afghanistan and the courage of, of Shagafa herself. Um, so that really heartens me. And that is for me is sort of the most important lever for change that we have today, whether it's for the SDGs or, um, you know, making progress uh, towards, you know, our common humanity in general. I am really excited that over the last few years, we have started seeing this sort of impatience among younger women that they are going to speak up. Uh, they're going to, um, you know, um, not wait for their turn uh, as we traditionally expect them to, you know, to earn their stripes, but that they're going to um, speak up in whichever way they can, uh, in, in whichever mechanism that uh, is, is available. And that, I think, is very exciting. And we're starting, you know, to see them on the covers of magazines and movements. And we just, I think, as women who have, um, you know, progressed in, in our lives, I think this is what this course is all about, right? You know, holding holding that door open and, and really um, welcoming them in and in fact allowing them to to lead the way. I think the second thing that I'm really excited about um, is the fact that you know especially over the last two years while this pandemic has rocked our world women have been at the front lines of the um, you know not only the, the challenges and we talk a lot about the challenges the losses that women have experienced whether it's in the job market and the marketplace the fact that you know many women have seen seen um, themselves pull out of that because they have to care for children or elderly um, violence against women i mean really when we talk about sdgs women have been uh, the primary losers uh, and, and including girls in education on all fronts during the last two years. But the flip side of that, the positive side is women have also been leading the movement for change. They have been the ones banding together on the ground, leading social enterprises that are precisely trying to um, stop this pandemic from taking over communities. And that to me is really exciting. And we're starting to see more support for social entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm sitting in Dubai and I'm seeing just this rise of women social entrepreneurs across the region. And I just think, you know, if anyone here is, is excited uh, about supporting women's movements, please support organizations that are run by women on the ground. This is where you're going to see the biggest change. This is how system change starts. Um, and then the third thing I'm really excited about, because this is a space I also work in, is we're really starting to see a, a, a very different dialogue around uh, philanthropy and aid. Um, and those are not going to replace uh, government policy and systems, but these are, uh, they, can, they can support innovation and they can really push uh, and support people who are not being supported. And we're starting to see a lot more women philanthropists speak up from different parts of the world, from emerging economies, not just from you know, the US. Um, and that's super exciting and it's changing the dynamic. Um, and it, it's really starting to um, put the resources where they are needed. And finally, I will just end that I think that, um, you know, coming back to the SDGs and the, the, win the short window that Purna talked about, um, it is going to take all of us to band together to get to those goals, but I don't think it is possible to go back to the old ways of doing things. We're going to have to turbocharge through the next eight years for us to be able to get to those goals. And part of that is making sure that women are leading the way. Brilliant, just thanks. Thank you so much. Um, 
Gail, I want to turn to you now um, and um, thank you so much for, for participating. Um, and so we're, we're shifting the lens slightly. So we, we've been looking at that macro level and I want to shift us into this, you know, now looking at the sort of meso, meso level, um, bringing in your insights both um, through your leadership roles that you've had in, in multinational organizations and now specifically your role as um, chair and um, board member. Um, and, and I was reflecting earlier, I love how you talk about, you know, we need top down and bottom up and middle layer. You know, we, we need to see the sort of popcorn, popcorn for change mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, through. Uh, so we'd love to get your perspective, Gail, on, on this conversation. Fantastic. Thanks, Zoe. So, um, Miso lens. This brings me back to when I uh, when I studied at Cambridge, and I'm going, oh, I couldn't remember those frameworks. So I'm talking about the Miso lens. I think what I'm talking most about is um, who do you need to be in order to drive change. So I don't specifically want to talk about only women driving change because I think it is this is a women's leadership. Uh, program, but I don't think what I'm talking about only pertains to women. But if we think about sort of the, the areas in which you can intervene in order to drive change, what is probably more important than anything is understanding the power you have where you are right now. Because if you can start driving change where you are right now, whether it's in a business, whether it's in a, a, a social enterprise, whether it's in policy, you know, that is the most important thing you can do right now. And so, you know, I often uh, see a lot of particularly young women that are frustrated because they're saying, well, you know, there's been a lot of um, talk about us driving change for some time. And, you know, the guys at the top, sometimes it is women, but often guys at the top all say, we, you know, we want you to take this leadership, et cetera. But, you know, the system is so inflexible that I can't move. Or you find uh, people on boards. You know, I'm fortunate that I'm on a number of boards with a lot of women. And we are frustrated because we are going, we, we, we are here. We are saying, come, come, come. And yet, you know, the shift doesn't happen. And so, you know, Zoe, as, as, you raised, I think the perhaps thinking outside of frameworks, thinking about change happens best when you, I call it, pull from the top and push from the bottom. So, you know, the role of policy, the role of to pull change up is absolutely important. That's both in diversity and sustainable shift in even innovation, really important. And then push from the bottom it's really because that's where the ideas and energy comes from, right? The ideas and energy really does come from everybody. As Mesa said, as Shagofa showed us, it really comes from people who desire the change to happen. But then the middle layer that you're talking about, I think is probably very relevant to people participating in this course, because no one wants to think of themselves. And I call it the insulation layer in an organization. None of us want to think about ourselves as the insulation layer, but unfortunately, uh, regardless of where we are, we are a middle layer somewhere. <laughs> and the issue with the middle layer is that it really doesn't like change. Even though it says it likes change, it doesn't really like change. Why is that? Well, for a couple of reasons. I think first of all, because often it has the most to lose, right? Secondly, because uh, not only does it have the most to lose, but it's in the operations of how we keep things going. And so, you know, shifting anything within that middle layer means that you actually have to change the system within which you're operating. And so I've often found that my most important role to play is to actually poke holes in the middle layer. If I'm the middle layer, I have, I have to just continually ask myself, what am I doing to ensure that I create this flow through? Or indeed, if I'm on a board, I need to have a look at the most critical 
layer, which is your kind of executive middle management layer, to say, what am I doing to enable those people to embrace a little more um, chaos in their lives so that we can create a shift? Thanks. Sarah. Great. I love that. I love that, Gail. Embrace chaos. Now, I think it's really interesting that you know, Perna kicked us off talking about systems and structures um, and that we've seen that as a as a thread. Um, Amazing. It reminds me of the the image that the metaphor that you used when we were talking about you know, how women at the top need to sort of you talked about opening the door, but also extend the ladder and bring others up. I, I love that 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 structure. And and Gillian, this this brings me to you um, again. Sort of we started with sort of systems and structures and and, and want to sort of look at that again. Um, specifically with with boards, um, you as in your role as director of leadership programs work with a lot of senior leaders, work with a lot of boards. I'm interested to get your reflections on on the opportunity for change there. Thank you, Zoe, and uh, thank you all of you. It's great to be part of this conversation. And I must say, Shagafer, I feel very humbled by what we've heard from you today. It was so moving, it sent shivers down my spine. And the passion that you shared with us there is something that I think if we could harness that passion for those women across the world who want to see themselves in board roles um, and start thinking about how they might get there, just imagine, um, what change that could be and what change that could be for the world really. And as Puma was saying, the structures at the moment, the structure is not set with many women at board levels. And, and indeed the recent research that's been published this week uh, from the 30% Club and Deloitte shows us that we're still in a position where it's only one in five uh, are women on boards. Only one in five are women. Um, fortunately, that position has, has shifted. It's improved on where it was at the previous survey in 2018. It's gone up um, just under, um, just over 1%. But actually, we're, we're still um, looking at a position where we've got fewer women. Um, but the speed of change has improved. The overall increase of women has gone up by 2.8. But since the last survey in 2018, it's literally a shift of one. And that shows me that we've still got lots of work to do. Um, and luckily, the UK is moving forward on this front, as well as the rest of the world, and hopefully we'll be aiming to get to a much better position by 2027. But there's still a lot of work to do. And, you know, I, I would say that there's, there's a lot that women themselves can do in terms of building their own inner purpose, their own courage and self-confidence and self-awareness to really think about, you know, I want to reach one of those positions. I want to have that ambition to be a board member, to sit at the board table, to influence the change. Uh, but there's also a lot of other players here that need to help us with this structural change. You know, the people who are recruiting for boards, both the external recruiters and the internal recruiters, thinking about what structural changes can they have in that process to bring women forward. And, and how indeed can we look out and seek those women who maybe have less confidence to put themselves forward because they know they don't tick all the boxes and we know that women are often very self-critical so they often won't put themselves forward because they might not feel that you know they have everything that it takes so that's a, a sense of people looking out to find these women but also the women themselves thinking about how they build their capability and capacity and inner self-confidence to take them on this journey. And I think it's such a wonderful opportunity for women because women, I think, can really help boards. Uh, the, the, the situation at the moment is that, that boards are facing growing pressures and scrutinies from investors, from the markets, um, and from the regulators. There's a lot of work to be done in terms of how to manage the climate and the nature-related risks and the impact of business on society. And you know, women can play a key role in this. They uh, can have a voice at that table. They can bring that diversity of thought, that diversity of perspective to help boards with some of these challenges. So I think we're at a point where there's a really, really 
um, moment, a big moment that people can take this advantage. And, uh, you know, I would really encourage women to think about that pipeline of development uh, to get to those positions, to have that ambition, to circulate with people who can give them that role model advice and mentor them and coach them to get to these positions so that those structural changes that Puma was talking about earlier can really start to shift and we can be in a much stronger position of influence. And the research has also told us that, you know, 5% of CEOs are women. That's not very many, but you know, those 5% of women, it says in the research, have actually influenced and brought more people, uh, more women into their boards, in their organizations. So those women are encouraging other women. Uh, and what we need is new women to come to the table, not just the same ones covering more positions, but actually new women stepping forward. So I think it's a great opportunity uh, and one which I think we can seize the moment. Brilliant, thanks, thanks Gillian. So, so much in that answer there. Um, I'm going to, um, we, we had lots of really interesting questions that were submitted in advance. Also going to get to the, the questions that you're, you're asking now in the chat. Um, and, and Perna, I'm going to turn to you first. Um, you are such a visual, visual listener, Perna. I can just see you <laughs> bubbling to want to speak. I can see you. <laughs> this really makes me laugh. Um, so I, I wanted to um, put, put a question to you, but also I think it's really in interesting. Again, another one of the themes I remember from our conversation that one of the final things that you said was decide what you are most passionate about. You can't do everything. Where are you going to lead change? Um, and um, one, of the, one of the questions that we, we had in, a, in advance was um, where do you think women can have the biggest impact when it comes to leading change. But of course, I would love to get your collective thoughts as you've been listening so actively to <laughs> the, other, the other things. I'm sure you'll have some other things to say. Well, people keep telling me I should have a poker face, but I'm really not interested. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you to everybody who's spoken and to all the energy and, and heart that we've heard from everybody so far. Um, I'm gonna cheat a little bit, Zoe, like you said, and just pull on a couple of things that I was reflecting on as people were speaking first of all i was really happy to hear about this you know the top and bottom and the middle that, that sort of in some places we call the pincer movement i think it needs to be from every direction from every person who feels they can um to push for those dynamics of change to be made real i've also I was really pleased to hear julian talking about working with recruiters about changing how they work because for me I think all the work around lean in and change women's behavior and so on slightly misses the point because um, women aren't the problem. So women don't have to fix their behavior to make the problem go away. The problem is elsewhere that constructs women as less than what they should be, less than fully human, not proper decision makers, not able to make change, not the rightful leaders of countries and organizations. So I think there's a lot of work to be done around the cultural context in which women's leadership is shaped, inhibited or enabled. Um, and that's what I'm talking about in terms of structural change. So why is it that women don't have the confidence to put themselves forward? We don't start with the fact that women don't have the confidence. I think the structural change, you have to look at why that's possible, why it's so persistent over geography and time that women are told that they are not the right people to be leading, that they don't have the competencies, that they're not the right politicians to vote for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what structural change for me looks like. And the third point I wanted to make is, that I think we have to disaggregate the category of women. Uh, and we haven't done that in this conversation today. It doesn't mean that nobody's done it elsewhere. Uh, but I think to, to think about women as one homogenous group is problematic. Uh, what we come from in terms of power, privilege, resources, access, ability, disability, race, immigration status, and so on, it's com com you know, really profoundly impacts upon what opportunities are available, how we're seen as fit for the, the, the opportunities and positions we're seeking to occupy, um, uh, whether we simply have access, physical access to rooms where decisions are being made, uh, and what, you know, things about challenging decision makers and the way things are done, they are absolutely influenced by who we are, where we are situated, in terms of those positions of power and authority uh, and, and disadvantage uh, and discrimination and inequality. So I think making those explicit and not just, you know, you know, 
putting down the ladders and breaking the glass ceilings and all these other metaphors that we use, uh, they are they have to be shaped and informed by our positionality in those those landscapes. Um, and sort of linking to what change we want to bring and how we want to do it are questions we have to ask ourselves. Am I prepared to be unpopular? Am I prepared to take the consequences of saying the wrong things? Am I prepared to forego certain things that might come if I toe the line? Now, those are big questions. And, you know, somebody asked me the other day to explain what role I'm in. And I said, I'm, I don't know. I can tell you what work I do, but I think my role in life is to be a troublemaker, to be a disruptor and to be comfortable with what you call making chaos and to be comfortable with the consequences. I'm trying to be polite and not use, not swear, but to be comfortable with upsetting the powers that be. And I, that's OK. I'm prepared to take the consequences. Not everybody is. So that will impact what you're prepared to do. Um, and I've gone on, so and I've forgotten the main question you asked me. I've done my general thoughts. Your main question was about, was it about tools we can use? Um, the main question was about um, what, in what way and what areas do you see that women can make a big impact when leading change? So it's a, a, a pretty massive question, and I think you, you, you've you covered it. I've touched on it in a number of ways, haven't I? Do you want me to yeah. say some more? I mean, I'm aware we've only got an hour for everybody, so I don't want to take up all yeah. the time. No, let, let, let's, pa let's pause it there, and I'll, I'll come back when I, I see your sort of active, active thinking face. <laughs> Um, but it did. Uh, I, I reminds me of our our interview actually, Perna. When, when this point about being a disruptor, I loved what you said about you know so, think what's your role. Sometimes your role is to kick the door down, and sometimes your role is to step through the door that someone has already pushed open. Um, so I think that's 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 an interesting insight, really, in terms of you know where can you make the biggest impact. I think it's deciding. You know, are, are you are, which one of those, and in, in what? You know, what's the context? Um, Shag, if I wanted to come to you, because um, one of the questions that we had in advance was um, around, you know, what opportunities are there to upskill and learn about leadership for young graduates, and, and would love to get your perspective on that. You know, we're, we're seeing so many encouraging examples of of leadership. In, in young people, which I, th I think has, has had a, a massive influence, you know, not least by shaming older so-called leaders into um, having to address their inaction. So so would love, love your thoughts on that question. Thank you very much. Um, I think one of the most, uh, most important aspects here is to, uh, first of all, question the structures. Uh, for example, for young graduates, it's really uh, most often happens that when you um, go for a, for a job, when you apply for, uh, for example, different positions, the structures are kind of predefined and you have to find, you have to think of, okay, which structure do I suit for? But let's just start questioning who defined these structures and why should we try as, uh, as newly graduates to fit ourselves into the predefined structures that, that might not fit, fit me or not, uh, might not fit my fellow uh, colleagues. So uh, one of the, uh, here is a very important point that we shouldn't keep um, the, this platform of what to do or what not to do or how to be the perfect fit for, for a job or for a position or uh, for example, when uh, mostly when it comes for women, it's very uh, most often said that uh, in Afghanistan, is that the best position for a uh, for a woman is to to be a teacher or to be a doctor? Uh, oh, that's the that's most suitable for you because you can also um, take care of your children at the same time. You can have more flexibility to uh, to also take uh, the house chores or take more responsibility of the children. But, um, the system, the system of the country and the, the education system, and I think that the most um, important, like the, the, the policies and the platform should not reflect this traditional culture, um, a systematic discrimination that is that is posed onto the uh, young graduates. And uh, let's say this oppose a kind of marginalized the, the, the creativity, marginalized the, um, the new perspectives and the fresh eyes that um, a young graduate 
graduates could uh, could um, bring to different organizations. So it's very important to provide a wider platforms and provide several opportunities and uh, break down those uh, um, traditional predefined structures that make us all try to fit into let's have the best cv let's have the best uh, you know, let's show how 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 much of uh, experience do you have or, or whatever and this for me i i lived in a system that was really pressuring and oppressing women and for me it was when i was applying for a job as a researcher and that was that was a big question because i first of all i wanted to oppose what is the idea of being a researcher and what is the idea of like a young woman going and stepping into the research and i had to take the risk to travel to most insecure areas of the country and i remember that one day in, in our office there was a project that uh, no one could go and it was an in action in one of the uh, very beautiful but uh, four uh, provinces and um there i was the one that stood up i said okay i take the risk and i will go there and um it was very important for me to understand that what i want to do needs a great passion and i have to give up on some of the things but the most important here is that how much the system is helping us how much the system is empowering us and it's not about um following a universal model but each each uh, platform and each uh, country and each context need their own structure and let's see let's find more ways to bring new eyes and and brings uh, bring fresh perspectives into into the board and do not uh, um, impose the, the traditional uh, structures uh, that, that might marginalize uh, young people and their ideas. Brilliant. Thanks, thanks, Shagba. That was a fantastic answer to that. Um, and I want to, to build on that. I'm going to come to you, Gail. We've had a, a, a question in the chat which, which builds on that. I mean, Shagba was talking about you know, needing the, the courage and the confidence. Um, and we've, we've had a question. Now, how can women tackle internalized issues around confidence or taking up space um, to really contribute to leading change? Like Shagafa was talking there about, you know, we, we mustn't worry about being the, the perfect fit. There's old research that says that, um, you know, women will only apply for a job if they've got 100% of the qualifications, which means they're missing out on so many opportunities and we're missing out on, on what they would bring to those roles. So I would love, I'd love to, to ask you that. And I'd also perhaps ask you to reflect on another question that we've had in the chat, which is um, your experience engaging with men to work with you to make systemic change. Um, the the um, person said, we need more men advocating, supporting women's progression and changing the system too. And we should say this, this course is completely inclusive. Um, we have men contributors and, and men are also you know, welcome to participate. Um, but yeah, so your thoughts on that, Gail? <laughs> okay, so um, again, I'd like to, to bring this down to kind of the human level, right? So the question about how can we be brave? How can we internally find our confidence? For me, the first thing, for me, the most important point, which is something Perna raises, what do you care about? What do you deeply, deeply care about? Because if you deeply, deeply care about something, you know, you will be brave, right? You will be brave. It's when you are um, not connected, sufficiently connected to that, you know, that perhaps it is a little more difficult for you to think about, well, you know, is this a point I should stand up for? Should that? But if you really feel it, you will, right? And I think that there's a lot of internal work to do. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not a, a young militant, I'm an old one. <laughs> but, you know, I can tell you that I've learned, I'm still learning the whole time about what's really important to me personally and where I think I not only have earned a voice or deserve to have a voice, but I have a voice that makes a difference, right? Mm -hmm. And that's an, very important to think about. So where can I have a voice that makes a difference? And on what topics can I have a voice that makes a difference? And if I can't have a voice that makes a difference on a topic, but I feel strongly about it, how do I get um, 
uh, skilled up to be able to have a voice. So I'll use a little example, Zoe. So, you know, I, I, I moved into the sustainability area without any um, uh, education on sustainability. I just run businesses forever, but I felt so strongly about this. But I did realize that I wouldn't be able to talk to a whole bunch of the, I call it the technocrats, right, who understood the um, kind of deep sustainability uh, issues and technical issues behind it. So that's why I did the MST, <laughs> right? And I did it when I was 50. So it wasn't like I was on my way up. <laughs> I was already at the top of my field, but I thought I've got to be able, well, not top, whatever the top is. I've got to be able to talk to people in a way that they'll say, look, she's not just an empty vessel. So I think there's something very important about um, understanding what you care about, giving yourself what you need, equipping yourself to be able to have that conversation, right? The second um, point I think is around the people that create change are the people who want it most. You know, if you ever look at anything in history, ever, right? And, and uh, Shagofa, I'm going to really understand that in the Afghanistan context, it's really hard because you know, the people who want it most have been the people leading for the change. And now suddenly they've had, I guess, a, a lid closed on them. That being said, and I've had experiences with many of those situations globally, and there are many of them happening, by the way, not to minimize Afghanistan. If you look at Myanmar now, right? So uh, things swing and, and things change, but, the people who want it most will be the ones who drive the change and will be the bravest. So that's again is where I come back and say, what do I care about most? Um, and ch change does take time, right? It does take time. So you've got to be ready to fall down, brush your knees off, step up again and get going. <laughs> it's a really important, you know, yes, we want the world to help us, uh, but it's us running the race. And the nice thing, as you see with the, the uh, group on the chat here, is we're not doing it on our own. I mean, if you think about it, we've got half the population in this world running the race together. That's amazing. And then we're not alone, right? So actually, you can't drive change by being only an opponent. Right, you have to drive change. And you know, I always love the jiu-jitsu idea because to drive change, you have to actually also put yourself in another person's shoes and be able to move with them and to ask for help. Right. And so, you know, we have a real issue, quite frankly, at the moment with some of the diversity um, uh, unintended consequences where we now have men feeling really scared and men feeling left out and men feeling like they are um, second class citizens and that has a major impact on how much we all progress together because as long as people are feeling when you back someone into a corner it's very hard for them to um, to collaborate with you to drive the change you need. And so, you know, the, the, I'd say the clever thinking that we all need to do is first of all, what do I care about? Secondly, uh, how, who do I need to drive this change? And how can I collaborate with others who have completely different views to me, right? And then finally, like, who's my team? which I think is, uh, you know, anyone that has the same view as you and wants to drive change. Brilliant. Thanks, Gail. Um, Mesa, I want to come to you next um, because Gail was talking there about how age 50, she did a master's in um, sustainability leadership at Cambridge. We were both on that program. Um, and we've had, we had a question about sort of, the imbalance in education opportunities for women who are financially challenged. Um, and I know that you spend a lot of time, you know, working with, you know, how can we get education um, to, to all women and girls? And, and wondered if you could just reflect on that a little bit, you know, how, how can we sort of level access to, 
to, to education and training opportunities so that all women can reach their full potential. Yeah, I think that it's really important that when we're talking about what women can do um, and sort of that courage and stepping up to, to fight for what they're passionate about and the change that they really want to see is that we the system still holds back way too many girls and women um, from even having that opportunity to sort of say, um, I can fight for what I believe in. I think, um, you know, I was born as a refugee, uh, a third generation refugee. My mother and my grandmother were also refugees. The only reason I am where I am today is because they made sure that I got a good education. And that meant a lot of sacrifices on their part along the way and a lot of determination. Um, the only thing that separates me from millions of girls and women who are today refugees is that I got that chance. And, you know, I, I think that a lot of that is my, my family's determination, my mother's determination, opportunity, luck. You know, I got to I got to move to Canada and and got a chance to to uh, start my life over, and I just want to be sure that when we give the message out to to women, you know, be brave, step up, take your chance, you know, do go after that. Um, the system still holds back way too many of us, and we need to work together uh, with the system, with men, with decision makers to to change that because at the core of any um, justice, equality for women, opportunity to do the kinds of things that we're talking about today is the fact that they get that basic right to an education. Um, and then, um, you know, we can also talk about what kind of education and what happens during that education. And, you know, does is it an education that empowers them, that allows them to, to dream? Uh, to to pursue any career that they want to pursue, to pursue the kinds of um, things that Shagafal was talking about, not what we, we prescribe for them, but what they what they want to do. Um, and so I think um, we need to fight for education. We need to um, make sure that uh, also for those who you know come through the education system that they can continue. When you look at um, uh, beyond K to 12, when you look at university education, um, in many parts of the world, we've made significant progress. If I think of the Arab world here, many countries now have more women graduates than we have men. Um, and um, that's not necessarily yielding economic results for those women because they still can't enter the marketplace or when they enter it, they, you know, they cannot stay in it because there are social and cultural and economic expectations that hold them back from fulfilling their, um, their, their full uh, opportunities. But that's not equal everywhere. You know, uh, women are still uh, held back from um, higher education, particularly uh, uh, vulnerable women. You know, if you think about refugee populations, something like 3% of them go on to higher education. Um, or if you think about women in rural um, or, or um, uh, least uh, developed economies, that's even less. So for me, that is the starting point, And that is the most important thing that we could be doing for gender equality and for our, uh, for our societies. And if, if we don't achieve that, if we don't make market progress towards that, then we're not going to achieve all of those other things. So yes, uh, being on boards, uh, being on um, you know uh, uh, leadership councils, et cetera, et cetera, those are all very, very critical. Um, but we 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 have to sort of um, keep our eye on the most you know the most vulnerable among us. Um, and, and work really, really hard to make sure that they have those same opportunities. Because otherwise, we're only as, you know, as weak and vulnerable as, uh, as our weakest uh, part of our, um, you know, community. Brilliant. Thanks, Mesa. Um, incredibly, we're down to our last five minutes. Um, 
going to try and achieve the impossible, which is to give you all um, the opportunity to um, sort of just put one, your voice into the mix before before we finish um, in terms of you know, perhaps you know what what you 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 would like to leave people with. Um, if you feel like you've already said it, then that's absolutely fine. Um, but if there's there's something that you'd like to to leave us with, Gillian, you've been patiently listening. Um, so I wanted to start with you. Um, if there was anything in particular that you wanted to to bring into the mix from um, the questions that we had in advance, or just final thoughts in our our, our last few minutes. I think final thoughts are, you know, th this is important for everyone and it's really important that everyone has an opportunity, men, women and cross cultures, you know, it, it's about um, inclusion for everybody and for women uh, to move forward, they need support of all those people around them. And, you know, what really matters, I think, is that, you know, we see women supporting women as well as men supporting women and that we build this unity and think about how we can give those opportunities and, and not put young people into stereotypical roles or boxes and limit their career aspirations just because of what's gone before. So I think, you know, young people and, and, and going through education, it's a very important time for them to have those dreams, as Mesa said, and those ambitions that may take them beyond what their, their family have done in the past or, or where they have been seen to go in the future. Brilliant. Thanks, Gillian. Gail, anything else you'd like to add? A sentence or two? Uh, yes. We no one can do this on their own right whether we're trying to change inequality whether we're trying to address the climate whether we're trying to make sure that the global south actually gets vaccinated right no one country no one person no one strata of society no one leadership team no one can do it on their own and so it requires all of us to understand where we can have our, our most significant impact. So thank you uh, to all of you for the impact you're having. Thanks, Gail. Mesa? Um, I guess I would just say that, uh, you know, because we are we are talking about this course today, I'm really excited about it. And, and I'm grateful to, to Zoe and her colleagues for putting this together. And I encourage you to, you know, take the lead, take the opportunity. And if you know someone um, that, you know, can't can't afford the course, or um, particularly women in in uh, some of these vulnerable communities that we're talking about, you know, we'd love to connect with you and and to make sure that they they do have this opportunity. So that's that's kind of my final message. And uh, I would love to connect with everyone who's who's part of this discussion today as well as a follow up. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mesa. Shakafa. Yeah, I would just say that uh, let's question all the borders and boxes and limitations that have been defined for us and let's fly over them. And we need all of ourselves. We need all, we need to do this together. And we, we need a worldwide solidarity of women and men together to do this. Uh, let's let's go beyond all the borders that that is defined and limiting and oppressing us, and let's question those structures. Brilliant, I love that. Thanks, Shagfa. Let's go beyond the borders and boxes that are um, confining us. So, um, Perna, we we started with you, so I want to give you the the last word before I close. Um, Thank final thought. <clears throat> Thank you, Zoe, and uh, just a couple of things. Um, I think we have to recognize if we're really dealing with and seeking to undo systems and structures of inequality and power, we're not always going to be having those who occupy power on our side. So while yes, Gail, we've got to know who we can work with and we've got to change minds, but it doesn't mean we're always going to say, I know you're, you're agreeing with me, but I'm just making explicit, that we're always going to say that everybody's going to be on board and that people aren't going to be unsettled, angered, or resistant to what we're doing so be ready for that anticipate it you know if we're looking for um a really nice story that says we're all going to benefit because women are going to be in charge it's not because some people are going to have to give up the power that they have uh, and there is a contestation that's going to take place and so i think you have to decide whether you're ready and willing to take on that upset or whether you want to do something more quiet in terms of your leadership and where that's going to go there's there's something about um I want women not to blame themselves for not getting to do what they want to do because there are so many obstacles in our way and so many people whose agenda is to stop us. 
I just want to refer quickly, so if I have a moment, to some re research that Pew did some years ago around uh, politicians and attitudes. And they asked people in terms of politicians, who is more trustworthy, men or women? Who has more integrity, men or women, etc.? A load of qualities that people think matter in politicians. And on all bar one, women came out better. And then they asked who they would vote for, and they all said men. Now, it's not about logical rationale. It's actually about cultural prejudice. And those are the things that we really have to be willing to deal with. And you can be the best candidate for a position on a board, in a university or wherever else, and still not be in that position, not through any fault of your own, but because other people's preferences and comfort networks exclude you. Um, one last point, if I may, on, on education. Maisa, I totally agree with you about the issue around quality of education, what it, it, what it, the content of education beyond the access issues. And I find it quite interesting that even when we have so many education systems that are not about empowerment and when so many global um, indicators are actually looking at access rather than content, even with those systems, girls who get an education do better in many, many regards than those who don't. So imagine what we could do if we actually address curriculum, bias in the classroom, prejudice, not calling on, girl, not calling on girls and so on. There's a whole programme of work there we could do. And my last point is, in your leadership and in your quest for leadership, don't presume to speak for communities. Ask, listen, stop talking, and then act. Thank you, yeah. Zoe. Lovely. And talking about stopping talking, um, we need to do that now because uh, we've, we've come to the end of this um, webinar. Um, so I'd like to thank you all so much. Um, you will be receiving a follow-up from us and we really hope that you will um, be curious about our course, Women Leading Change. It definitely builds on a lot of these themes in terms of building the capability, the confidence, the courage, and the commitment to, to drive change. So thank you all. It's been a wonderful conversation. Um, feel incredibly humbled to be in your presence. And uh, thank you all who've been um, listening and, and sharing your questions. And um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.